the Radical Secular Podcast, dedicated to the separation of church and state and the pursuit of justice. Welcome to the Radical Secular Podcast. I'm Sean Prophet. I'm Christoph Defoe. This week, we're going to discuss the execution hypothesis. This is the hypothesis that Homo sapiens went through a process of self-domestication by killing the most violent troublemakers in our species. Over many thousands of generations, we humans reduced our capacity for reactive aggression. Today's show is part of our continuing coverage on the Radical Secular Podcast, which began with episodes 29 and 31. Our discussion is based on Richard Rangham's book, The Goodness Paradox. Today, we'll cover chapters 5, 6, and 7. And this isn't just another anthropological digression. Everything we're going to talk about today connects directly to our cultural disagreements. Mm -hmm. Who's entitled to what share of our common resources? the entire divide between Democrats and Republicans. We're going to revisit our central civilizational conflict between the strict father punishing scarcity mentality more closely related to chimpanzees and the nurturing mother cooperative sharing type of society exemplified by bonobos. This couldn't be more relevant to America's political divide, which really isn't a divide at all. It's more of a death struggle between a culture of cooperation and human rights versus a culture of oppression. And it's a very, very old struggle, as we'll find out. Our history is brutal, but we wouldn't be here without it. In our news wrap up this week, we'll talk about COVID vaccines, states prematurely lifting their COVID restrictions, and of course, cancel culture, the old bugaboo, and Governor Cuomo, QAnon, Trump's worsening fortunes, and the SpaceX Starship. Before we get into any of that, though, I want to remind you that if you like our show, make sure to subscribe, leave us a review, and tell your friends to listen. New episodes post Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. And if you're into reading, check out the blog at theradicalsecular.com. Visit our website at theradicalsecular.com and sign up for free access to exclusive content and giveaways, our full library of episodes, and articles at the Radical Secular blog. Email us with your comments and suggestions, and follow us on social media. All right. Let's get into the t-shirts. Uh, my t-shirt today, uh, it says, Choose Darkness. Nice. And it is a little baby goat of Mendes. <laughs> and the whole point here is not that we want to be evil or we want darkness or anything mm. else like that. The idea is that by, by being willing to delve into the dark side of our nature, we actually mm. can find and redefine what is good about humanity. And so, and that's really kind of the entire point of this segment, which is really dark because it talks about that we killed a lot of people intentionally in our evolution. So that's, uh, that's what, that's what we're about is, uh, in general is going into this shadowy stuff here on the radical secular. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what do you got on your shirt, Christoph? Yeah, absolutely. So I just to comment on what you just said, I mean, I think that's really important because, uh, and we're going to talk about this later on, but there's this idea that only evil people do bad things or or even capable of bad things, right? And mm -hmm. if you are, and, and only good people are capable of doing decent things or good things. So like these, these, these caricatures of like every bad, every despot is, is, uh, is, it eats babies at night, <laughs> and, uh, and right, like, but really, as a reality, despots are really nice to their families, and they're yeah. and might be the guy who plow who shovels your driveway or some shit, but also is a despot. So anyway, I think that's really important. I'm really interested. I'm really looking forward to getting into the conversation. Um, uh, so yeah. now, my that my, my T-shirt today is um, very simple, but I'll just show it first. Nice. And uh, just a good old uh, six-speed uh, gearbox there, but it's a, you'll note that it is the European gearbox with the reg with the re with the uh, reverse on the far left side of the rather than the uh, far right side and back. Which uh, <laughs> I, I, I've been driving stick a long time. I love driving stick, but the reason why I'm, I, and my car currently is probably the last car that I'll drive with a manual transmission because I'm hoping the next car will be a, a hot EV. Yeah. Um, but uh, we bought this car a couple of years ago and and we're going to just going to drive. We were like it was hard to find manual transmissions as it is. And we're like, look, let's buy a car and just run it until it just is just done. And then we'll get an EV. Um, yeah. But but uh, anyway, so uh, but I wore this today because I'm really obsessed with motorcycles right now because I just got the motorcycle. It And I went out on a freezing, freezing ride yesterday. And I was and I was thinking to myself because it was like, you know, whatever, 35 degrees here in New Jersey, really cold. But I went out anyway. 
And as I was telling telling you before the show, Sean, the o- I have heated grips on the bike, but the only thing that got cold were my clutch fingers. Mm-hmm. So I have like two because they're not on the grip the whole time, right? So they're actually out all the time and they're constantly being pulled, especially in city traffic, where it's mm-hmm. like you're pulling that clutch constantly, right? Like you're downshifting, you're upshifting, you're downshifting, you're upshifting. Um, and so when I thought about that, I was like, ah, the shirt. That's the old manual transmission shirt. So that's a roundabout way of describing why I wore this shirt today. Um, I love motorcycles. I can't wait till you get yours delivered. Um, and uh, we're waiting. I'm ready for the season. Yep, absolutely. I've got our fingers crossed that we get it soon and uh, we'll be able to talk <laughs> about it. And Absolutely. And and then share stories, hopefully not um, stories of crashing, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, let's get into the news. Uh, This week in COVID, President Biden announced that 300 million Americans will be vaccinated by the end of May. And this is just fantastic news. I'm seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. Jillian and I are last on every vaccine list, but to realize that we could actually get our jabs in the next two months has lightened our mood considerably this week. So it's starting to look like we could see a real return to normalcy later this year. Fingers crossed again. Absolutely, man. I, I, I am so stoked about this and the light at the end of the tunnel i lindsay and i i think everybody is really the the fatigue covid fatigue level is high um i've been i read an article recently from the uh from the economist or blurb about an article because it was behind a paywall but the blurb and the bottom line is that like workers are getting who were happy to be working from home in the first instance are now finding that are are, are, are are itching to get back into the office in a lot of ways, at least part of the time to just to add structure to, the, to, to one's life and just to see people. So I agree with you on that. Well, it's really brutal. You know, it's like careful what you wish for. Everybody wishes they could spend more time <laughs> at home. Uh, you know, not so much. Exactly. Is, it merely mirrors to me what what they say about people who retire, because a lot of times people retire from their jobs and they're dead within a few years because. Yep. You're just not meant to be sitting around at home all the time. Yep, exactly. It it really ends up. Uh, I I always need to say it this way: like we're problem solvers, mm-hmm. right? And and this and is why social. Think, we're social. And social, exactly. Social. Pro- this is why I think that people like Nancy Pelosi and you have these uh, that are their entire job. They're eighty. She's eighty years old, right? But her entire job is engaging with people and thinking and solving problems, and it, that keeps your brain alive, right? That and of course her outstanding healthcare that she gets. But um, right. <laughs> that that's a huge factor, also. <laughs> that's yeah. But like people like Biden, these like they're old for sure. But also like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? She was sharp until the very end. And like, right, like it's I think remaining engaged is key. That's what I was going to say. Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, got to stay engaged. And that's mm-hmm. actually one of the reasons why we started this show, because we were both sitting at home going nuts. Exactly. So, OK, well, speaking of nuts, um, the laughing stock of America, the Republic of Texas, apparently not having killed enough of its citizens by cutting off its electricity, declared the COVID-19 pandemic to be officially over two months early. Governor Greg Abbott tweeted that he's opening everything and repealed all mask orders. And now Abbott's already tried to deflect blame to President Biden, tweeting that Biden is releasing COVID-positive illegal immigrants into Texas. I mean, can you just believe this bad faith? It's so bad. It's so bad. It's so it's it's infuriating. Um, you see a lot of I, I think I think uh, down in Florida, they're hosting like a motorcycle rally down there in Daytona. Um, uh, all classy things happen in Daytona, after all. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, but it's just like these ideas. It's like we are we are we just talk about being at the, the light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there. And, and the unwillingness to just sort of stick. We're almost there, you know, and like just and of course they're doing this, you know, of course they're doing this. It's just 11th hour malfeasance. And in Mississippi, same thing. They looked at Texas and said, hey, good plan. Let's kill some of our people, too. You know, <laughs> uh, Governor Tate Reeves in from Mississippi repealed his state's mask mandate, saying the governor's office is getting out of the business of telling people what they can and cannot do. What the fuck? I mean, what the fuck is the job of a governor if not telling people what to do? Right. I mean, what do they think the law is for? The job of the uh, the job of the executive branch is to enforce the law. Right. What I mean, it's just we talk about this a lot on the show. It's just the idea that people think that there just ought to be no law that, or that, that there's some sort of this this caricature of freedom. 
uh, in, in a world in which everyone just gets to just do whatever they want. And we're going to, again, we're going to talk about this chimpanzee versus bonobo yeah. way of looking at the world down the, the, later on in the show. Yeah, well, I, Pre President Biden called the premature lifting of mask orders Neanderthal thinking, and of course, which which was which was spot on. But Republicans, they got offended. It's like, well, first you call us deplorables and then you call us, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then now it's Neanderthals. Well, Jim Molester Jordan was particularly upset oh. about it. But the, the ironic thing is that Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis lived from 400,000 to about 28,000 years ago, was pretty damn intelligent, actually, and physically superior <laughs> to modern humans. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Biden is technically corrected in the Neanderthal brain, a quote, smaller area was available for social functioning. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Even though we know that Republicans are modern Homo sapiens, they've deliberately blocked out parts of their social brain and plugged in groupthink and dogma in its place. And so it's and it's not just the Republican Party, it's the Catholic Church. Echoing the stem cell controversy of 20 years ago, the Catholic Church weighed in against a new vaccine from Johnson & Johnson because it was developed using human fetal tissue cells. Uh, and this quote, this is the quote. When testing whether vaccines work, both Pfizer and Moderna used fetal cell lines derived from fetal tissue taken from elective abortions in the 1970s and 1980s, according to James Lawler, an infectious disease specialist at Nebraska Medicine. They did not use the lines during the development or production phase, so they are not inside the injection, Lawler said. In creating its vaccine, Johnson & Johnson used cells that are descended from tissue taken from a 1985 elective abortion. That distinction was enough to prompt the Archdiocese of New Orleans on Friday to single out the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, saying it is morally compromised as it uses the abortion-derived cell line in development and production of the vaccine, as well as the testing. I mean, what, what do you even say to crap like this? It's just Pfizer and Moderna still use the cells. And what's wrong with using those cells anyway? They, they, not getting the vaccine might actually kill you, and it isn't going to bring back a fetus from 36 years ago. I, how just fucking ludicrous can religion be? I know. And, you know, it's really astonishing, Sean, because these are the same people who talk about right to life, right? This The entire concept here is that you have some sort of life that is, has been destroyed 30 fucking six years ago. And suddenly, I mean, first of all, it was 36 years ago. Second of all, it wasn't a life. And third of all, aren't you the goal of the fucking vaccine is to save lives, right? And by the way, if this is outright irresponsible because there's already enough controversy, mm -hmm. made up controversy around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as it is. And so yeah. it is really, really deeply irresponsible and deeply counterproductive for the Catholic Church, the biggest fucking church organization on the planet to come out yeah. and say, oh, by the way, we're questioning this. I mean, it is, it's, it's malfeasance. It is, it is openly destructive. Well, and it also, I have to point out again, one of our hobby horses here, but dualism, okay? Because mm -hmm. the only reason anybody would care, would give a fuck about these aborted cells is that they might have some connection to a soul, okay? Well, where did this soul go in 35 years when these cells have been dividing and dividing and dividing in a laboratory? Not Nobody's alive. It's just, these, these cells are just like a perpetual culture. It's like a yeast culture or something mm -hmm. that you just keep going and going and going, right? So if you didn't think that there was some kind of fucking ghost or spirit that was involved here, it's just software. It's a, it's a, it's a program. It's DNA, right? So why are we worried about DNA replicating? It's just, it's just it boggles the mind how much dualism poisons everything. That is so important. The dualism issue, the ghost in the machine, right? Which is, uh, that's how I'd like to describe it to people who don't fully understand when we, what we talk about when, when we say dualism. We mean this sense that you get, that we get in our society and that's part of our lore and our culture is that as if like my body is like a big robot and there's the, the actual me is somewhere inside pulling levers, right? Looking or somewhere out through else. my eyes, right? Or somewhere else. But this entire idea I can't emphasize enough how contradictory this is because if do you or do you not care about lives? And this gets to our mm -hmm. inter our our uh, utilitarian versus deontological perspective, right? Because you're like, look, um, do you care about more people getting this vaccine and saving? Like we're, we're, we're losing 1,500 people a day in the United States. Don't you want to get that number down? But no, 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 no. You care about a 36-year-old culture in a, fuck, a, a, a fucking uh, cell culture. It's insane. It is insane and it is counterproductive. And it, again, it's deontological because it looks at this this idea, the, the, this, this, this soul idea, this idea that there's something inherently valuable in a cell as opposed to yeah. the out, real outcomes for real people. 
uh, down the road be, w w for, for those who do or do not get the vaccine. Yeah, it's just it's it's unbelievable. And it, it, it whatever issue you're dealing with, somehow it always goes back to dualism. Always, <laughs> always. Um, all right. Well, this week in cancel culture, this is cancel culture is turning into just one of the most poisonous ideas out there. And this time it was, OK, the estate of Theodore Geisel, a.k.a. Dr. Seuss, has decided not to reprint six of his books that dehumanized non-white ethnicities. Good idea, right? Of course, over at Fox News, they're spitting nails. There were something like 130 mentions on Fox News of the controversy. And you know, when they spend that much air on the subject, A, they sense a cultural defeat. And B, they're completely out of real ideas. I mean, when Fox gets this worked up about something, it, it is just, it is like, it's like surrender, right? They, they're, they're, they're losing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the tan suit. It's like the tan suit controversy, right? Like you're just like it, when you're grasping at things to be upset about, you know that you're losing. It's just, I mean, it's butthurt. It's MAGA cope. It's whatever you want to call it, um, because this is the free market. This is what the Republicans are just they fawn all over. They cream all over the free market. And now all of a sudden, a private company, private publisher deciding not to publish publish their own copyrighted content and they freak out. And so it just goes to show how bottomless their pit of bad faith really is because they only like the free market when it goes their way. Um, what do they want to happen? Do they want the government to order Ted Geisel's estate to publish these books? Because that's kind of what it sounds like, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and this brings me to Tucker Carlson's segment on this, which was just, it, it was, um, the segment about this was as much worse than ordinary Tucker Carlson, then Tucker Carlson is worse than, say, Rachel Maddow. It was just like, this was a new level of absurd here, okay? <laughs> he said that, of course, in fact, it is liberals who are the real racists, which makes no sense until you really understand right-wing orthodoxy on racism, which goes as follows, if you can even follow this argument, okay? Real racism in Tucker Carlson's mind is being practiced against white people by focusing on identity politics. And this boils down to a sort of second grade retort of, I know you are, but what am I? Because if you discuss white privilege or call a white person racist, you're only doing it because you're a racist against white people, okay? Listen to this incredible paranoia on his part. Now, and, and it just says, like the idea, I'm a white person, how can I be racist against white people? It just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So he says, canceling Dr. Seuss isn't stupid, it's intentional. They're banning Dr. Seuss, not because he was a racist, but precisely because he wasn't. That's why the forces of wokeness hate Dr. Seuss, he says. When the people in charge cancel Dr. Seuss, what they're really trying to eliminate is a very specific kind of mid-century American culture a culture that championed meritocracy and colorblindness and the superiority of individual achievement over tribal identity, he explained. Wow, I mean, somebody needs to go back and tell black people in the 1950s who had to use separate bathrooms, water fountains, and lunch counters that they were living in a meritocracy. I, 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 you know, Carlson continues, these were once called liberal values. Modern liberals don't want to be reminded that they once believed any of this. If your kids are allowed to read Dr. Seuss, they will know this was a different country not so long ago, a place where people tried hard not to hate each other, a place where the <laughs> place... I just can't even listen to that with a fucking straight face. <laughs> a place where the population was encouraged, begged by its leaders to reject identity politics in favor of universal values and the things that connect us all. <laughs> <laughs> that is comical. That is comical if it weren't so fucking infuriating, right? Because like, I mean, <laughs> look, I mean, it's just we're, like the, the the phrase that the, the 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 phrase where people tried not to hate each other. Like, wow. I mean, just that is so obviously not true. True to anybody who understands American history. I mean, there was, I don't know, there was the 400 years of slavery. There was the Jim Crow. There was the torpedoing of reconstruction. There was the white backlash, to the civil rights movement. There is the white backlash to, uh, I mean, we could go on and we, uh, what about it, the lynchings? I mean, we could just go on and on. It is, this is, this is deeply infuriating and, and, and it's really insulting, right? right. To people of color. Uh, who it, have it, suffered through all of this. 
it's so insulting because in the 1950s, there wasn't like official slavery, but how many white families had a black housekeeper in those mm -hmm. days? And as long as she's working for you for very low money, you're not going to hate her. So exactly. I mean, <laughs> and well, it's this whole thing of basically like he want the, the fact that he is citing mid century. Well, first of all, let me point out, let me point this out because I wrote this down. And that is people. He said the people in charge canceled Dr. Seuss. And that goes back to your point. It's like, no, the people in charge. Who who are these people in charge? It's always. If, Coastal if you, intellectual elites, right? And, exactly, but it's like, <laughs> and, and, like, what does that mean? So, so no globalists, one, globalists, nobody, nobody told the Dr. Seuss uh, legacy organization to do this. They made this decision based on market forces, probably made based on a reflection. This is exactly the kind of reflection we want people to have. We don't want the government to be forcing people to think a certain way. We want people to be thoughtful and look back and say, oh my God, you know what? We were wrong back then. And, mm -hmm. it, and so this, this is exactly the kind of reconciliation, Sean, that I want to see from white people is not that like all of a sudden that you have to kowtow to black people or suddenly right black people don't want revenge black people want equality and that is just just saying like look we were wrong in the past let's do something different and by the way this really dovetails well we're going to talk about this in a minute with the um with the Cuomo thing we'll talk about that but like you know coming out and saying like holy shit I was wrong and well, that was a big fucking mistake um but uh, so so I, I just want to finish this off, but like, it's my big problem with this Tucker Carlson thing, which is obviously there's lots of it, but the big issue here is the lie that and uh, that there was a time in which racism was not a problem, as if mm -hmm. talking about the inherent racism in America is itself the problem, not the racism, right. but talking about it is the problem and and this reminds me of growing up in the 90s when racism was we lived in a post-racial america remember back in the 90s mm -hmm. we all this is what we all <laughs> thought right and this this is what's this is what we were told that we live and like but really we were just living in the last part where we were living in the last uh gasps of an era in which white people got to pretend that racism is no longer an issue and black people just dealt with it well, yeah, and this is why I mentioned globalism, and this is why Trump and all of his minions you know, were so against globalism, because the, the, the world that Tucker Carlson and Trump and all the rest of the white nationalists are protecting is one in which white people were the big fish in the small pond. I mean, yep. America is only 4% of the world's population, okay? And so uh, having a majority of 4% while recognizing that, you know, white people are like a four to one minority in the world, okay? Four to one. The, the world is only about 20% Caucasian. And so it's like we are going from being this big fish in a tiny pond to being a small fish in a much bigger pond of the world. And mm -hmm. people hate it. Yep. It's and like like we like I say, and, and people say it all the time, uh, equality feels like oppression when you're used to privilege. And that's that is that is the gist of what of what we are we are we are experiencing with this this insane white lash backlash from the right since really exploding during the beginning of the Obama era, right? Because that was the that was the that was the last straw for them in terms of holy shit, we really are quote losing our country, right? Yep. And and the thing about it is is that they will lose, they are losing, and there's no yep. way that they can really turn it around because if you're any company, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Nike, it doesn't matter who you are, okay, uh, or if you're Dr. Seuss. You want to sell to a global audience, and yep. if if you have if your books insult like eighty percent of that audience, <laughs> right, right. And by the way, that eighty percent of that audience is now empowered to say something about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the eighty percent, like those eighty percent, were were offended before, but now we, the rest of the globe, the rest of the country, the rest of the culture says, no, actually, we're not okay with this. We we didn't have the power before to say that but we do now and and like you say uh, they're Tucker Carlson and his minions and the Trumpists and the MAGA people they're gonna lose they're gonna lose yeah and so what's happening also is when it comes to Native Americans Native Americans mm -hmm. are now in more solidarity with that 80 percent of the world that is not white and so we have you know if you're if you're a white nationalist it adds insult to injury Jeep announced this week that it's going to consider dropping the brand Cherokee from its lineup 
Business Insider reports that following criticism from the Cherokee Nation's leader, the top boss at Jeep's newly formed parent company, Stellantis, said the automaker is mulling the idea of dropping the Native American tribe's name from its vehicles. Stellantis CEO Carlos Tavares told the Wall Street Journal. Now, that's interesting. Uh, it, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a CEO of a major American company that is has a has a Latino name. That's something mm -hmm. you haven't seen. OK, so the company's in talks about the name with the Cherokee Nation. He indicated Stellantis is open to rebranding its SUVs. We are ready to go at any point up to the point where we decide with the appropriate people and with no intermediaries, Tavares told the outlet. At this stage, I don't know if there's a real problem, but if there is one, well, of course, we will solve it. I think that the important thing here is that they are engaging with the Native American, um, you know, with the Cherokee uh, a nation in particular, the, the Cherokee tribe in particular, and engaging with them and, and trying to understand and just caring and trying to understand what they uh, what matters to them. Now, contrast contrast this with um, the Washington races, the football team um, mm -hmm. and now known <laughs> as the Washington football team. But I used to call them the Washington races because I refuse to say the name. Um, mm -hmm. But they went they refused to even engage with the issue. They were sued over it, in fact. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's how tooth and nail they were. They wanted to sort of fight. And then finally, and this is this is reflective of the times. Right. And this also demonstrates how protests matter, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, like activism matters, because now these companies really are taking a hard look at this. And I, I'm telling you, man, the stuff that happened over this last summer, uh, the George Floyd uh, uh, the demonstrations and protests, that had precipitated all of these changes, right? And I, I, it's just so important to recognize that this sort of activism really does matter. And that's why they, on the right, demonize it so much, because they know it, it works. Well, they've been able to suppress the vote, so they've been able to isolate uh, political action from, uh, from, from social activism, right? Mm -hmm. But they can't... I, Customer is a customer. You can't really, you cannot really isolate corporations from being responsive to their customers. And so that brings me to the next point that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Hasbro, the toy company, announced that from now on, Mr. Potato Head will just be called Potato Head. This is an article from Fast Company. It says, the toy giant Hasbro is rebranding its iconic Mr. Potato Head by dropping the Mr. from the name. On the surface, it may seem like a subtle shift, but it is designed to break away from traditional gender norms, particularly when it comes to creating potato head families, how toddlers frequently play with the toy, according to Hasbro's research. But starting this fall, when the new brand is unveiled, kids will have a blank slate to create same-sex families or single-parent families. It's a prime example of the way heritage toy brands are evolving to stay relevant in the 21st century. And man, I just got to say, it really sucks to be a conservative <laughs> in today's America, because if, if you want to hate on brown people, natives or gay potato families, the walls are closing in. <laughs> you yeah, just man. can't get no disrespect anymore. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? This is it's so great. And this similar thing happened with and with the Aunt Jemima. They got rid of that. Right. They like they they've rebranded the Aunt Jemima. And my question to the conservative out here who's flipping out about this, of course, they're mm -hmm. not listening to this show, but um, uh, it is. So what? And, and this is what I always want to ask conservatives, like, like, for example, I want to ask Tucker Carlson. So who do you think who is those people that are doing the canceling? Like, because they wouldn't be able to answer that question. Similarly, here is what are you arguing that we should have racist symbols mm -hmm. or are you arguing that Aunt Jemima is not a racist symbol? But these are questions that that like like that. These arguments are de are deliberately intellectually bankrupt. They are like we always like we've been saying, they're just rallying cries. They're just tribal yeah. rallying cries. They don't actually stand for anything. And that's why the cancel culture thing is so interesting and infuriating. Because again, if you really ask somebody what cancel culture is, they won't be able to answer it. Because no. other than to say, oh, it's consequences. That's all it is. It's completely irrational. It's also it's not just consequences. It's democracy. People mm -hmm. are voting to change the culture. They exactly. are voting to change the culture with their dollars and with their dollars. <laughs> so my final note about cancel culture, which, which speaks to hypocrisy, was a meme that I found on Facebook. And it says, please don't talk to me about cancel culture. I was a Christian child of the 90s. We stopped listening to Sandy, Patty and Amy Grant, stopped watching Disney and avoided Procter and Gamble products. Christians perfected cancel culture. They just don't like it when the tables turn. Boom. <laughs> and you know what? And and you, you know what? Who else did a mic drop on this earlier this week is Hillary Clinton. 
And she uh, said, and she said she talked about the part like, so are you telling me the party of freedom fries is talking about cancel culture? Right. <laughs> you remember freedom fries? They canceled the entire country of France because they refused to join the Iraq war. Right. No, this is that's insane. That was perfect. And, you know, a lot of people probably aren't going to get that reference, especially mm -hmm. not, you know, millennials <laughs> who are right, probably right, two right, years right. old when that happened. Exactly. But, <laughs> I remember, though, I remember I, I remember freedom fries very, very well, very, very well. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, we have to talk about the Democrats circular firing squad this week, because just before minutes before we got on to this taping, the Senate has finally passed the covid relief bill, one point nine trillion dollars yeah. with all this angst and the voterama and the reading of the bill out loud and Kristen Cinema doing a little dance as she, you know, kind of quashed the minimum wage hike. It's just mm -hmm. like it was a lot of drama here. But um we got to talk about the whole circular firing squad. I'll, I'll get back to the bill. But the first thing is Andrew Cuomo. I was so happy to see him stick to his guns and say that he won't resign following a spate of sexual harassment allegations. And this is not because I've turned on the idea of Me Too. Not at all. Um, because Governor Cuomo's response was that he gave a heartfelt apology. He's fully cooperating with an investigation. And he acted like he was genuinely chastised. And, you know, it's getting harder and harder to separate progressive Democrats who care about women's equality and Me Too issues from Republicans setting up a political hit job to take down a Democrat. And we saw this happen with Al Franken, you know, yep. and we just threw him under a bus. He did really virtually nothing. And it's it's about time that we started taking a closer look at these sex harassment scandals and establishing some kind of parameters and baselines. It's, you know, one thing if we had a standard across the board and there was a clear violation, but GOP politicians routinely refuse to resign, and there are dozens to hundreds of Republicans with far worse scandals and actual crimes all across the country who aren't resigning. So we just can't throw our people to the winds. And there's an example of this double standard, which is that, you know, we had Katie Hill, a uh, congresswoman from Santa Clarita Valley, who resigned in 2019 because she was involved in a thruple and her ex-husband leaked some nude photos of her. And it was a, just it was just revenge porn. It was stupid. And but she resigned. And but now we have the crazy QAnon lady uh, who wears her censored mask on the House floor, Marjorie Taylor Greene. She was outed as having openly cheated with a gym instructor and she's still in Congress. So, you know, we have to have some kind of cohesive Democratic political strategy on harassment and sex scandals and stop caving on our side when Republicans get away with everything. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, I'm certainly not condoning, obviously uh, condoning or minimizing um, sexual harassment or uh, certainly not sexual assault, although that's not what Cuomo has been. Um, uh, that would be a different ball game. I really do think that would be a different ball game. Um, but um, if he had like credible sexual assault allegations, uh, I think there is a distinction to be made here between sexual assault and sexual harassment. None of neither which is good. I think the I think that the, the the genuine contrition here is really important. It certainly differentiates the how the right deals with this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'll make an analogy here too to Ralph Northam out in uh, in North in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And he had the, the blackface scandal from back when he was in a college or law school or something like that. And my reaction to that is not he should resign because mm -hmm. my reaction to that, he comes out and says, like, holy shit, in retrospect, I was obviously wrong. I am sorry. And by the way, here are all the progressive things that I'm doing today. You know, mm -hmm. and that for me is what I want. I don't want him to resign. And then what? So then, then the a G, then uh, the, you have to do a re um, a, uh, a runoff election, and a GOP guy gets gets into the gets into gets gets the uh, gets the governorship. And now uh, all the things, all the racism that I'm concerned about that he did back in 30 years ago. Now the GOP wants to do that same kind of shit today, right? So you know, it's so anyway, we have to be practical about this. Is my thing. We have to be practical about this stuff. This is chapter and verse what you always talk about consequentialism versus deontology. And, and yes. we, you know, we, we talk, we've talked about this on several episodes now. I mean, what would you rather have? Would you rather have us throw our own people under the bus for honor, right? For, so we mm -hmm. can main, somehow maintain some sort of honor or whatever that we are absolutely consistent, right? But in the meantime, by doing so, we hurt women, people of color, you know, poor people, you know. Exactly. exactly. What's the point? What is gained? What is served by doing that? 
Right. And, and look, it's not like it, it, this is important, too, is that it's not as though there's some Republicans out there that are like, oh, wow, well, the Democrats really stuck to their principles. So I'm going to now <laughs> vote for them. Absolutely <laughs> not. Like you're not changing any minds by doing that. And if you are losing people on the far left, let them go. Right. If you are losing if you are losing um, the, uh, you know, the the sort of Bernie Sanders left uh, on the margins, let them go because it because the the bigger picture matters here. Yeah. And this is what I have to talk about now, because there's been all of these defections. I mean, it's not uh, how should I say it, it's it's social media. It's not significant because, you know, we have enough time before the next election to, to turn this back around. But a lot of progressives on social media are just ready to jump ship from the Democratic Party based on the idea that, you know, there's been broken promises that, you know, the whole minimum wage thing. We always knew the minimum wage was going to be a heavy lift. We mm -hmm. always knew that the entire COVID relief bill was going to be a heavy lift. And the and Re Republicans don't want everybody to get checks. So, you know, this week, Biden, he limited the eligibility in the plan for the $1,400 checks to those making 80000 per year or less. And, you know, I had a guy who somebody that I really respected and uh, he was he just was going on and on this week and just just trying to nail Biden to the wall, saying that his election reelection was going to be you know, was now that he wasn't going to get reelected. And, um, you know, it just, I don't know. I, 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 I'm kind of almost out of things to say about these people because, you know, the same thing happened when the eight or seven Democrats defected and didn't support the minimum wage rise. It's like, well, guys, 43 Democrats supported raising the minimum wage and zero Republicans supported it. Okay, you have 50 Republicans vote against raising the minimum wage and eight Democrats, but yet they're ready to say, you know, both parties are fucking the same. I mean, I, I, I just I don't know. What do you think about this? I hear you. And uh, I have mixed feelings about it in the sense that, like, I, I, I sympathize with some liberal frustrations in general. Right. Because we all want a $15 minimum. I want a fucking $20 minimum wage, right? Um, we, uh, $15 enough is frankly not enough. I mean, that that's, that's just the very beginning. And, and, and that will become uh, $15 that might be okay today in five years. That's already, that's already right. If it's not indexed to inflation, then what the fuck? Anyway, the point is that uh, I want robust, strong action from Democrats. That's what I think I want to, I want people, I want Democrats to be able to deliver uh, promises that actually impact people's lives very directly in very obvious ways, in ways in which that even the low information voter who doesn't pay attention most of the time will notice all of a sudden, oh my God, $1,400. So I, and, and oh my God, infrastructure projects, like all this sort of stuff. But again, we have to deal with the reality of where we are. We have Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin's basically a Republican, right? Um, yeah. And, and also he has a, an absurd amount of power now that he is wielding mm -hmm. because he has it right. And this was, this was a predictable Drew, Drew Scott uh, when he was on the show, because we, uh, he mentioned this exact, this exact problem, Joe Manchin, once he gets this power, power corrupts. Right. And yeah. now he has, he is basically like the, uh, he is the arbiter of what happens in the democratic party in the Senate right now. And so I think that Biden did what he had to do to get the fucking thing passed. And this gets back to the deontological outcome mm -hmm. versus the utilitarian outcome. Yes, we would all love a $20 minimum wage, $15 minimum wage, but we're not going to get that. So let's take what we can get and we can come back and fight another day. It reminds me so much this idea. I mean, people need to understand the, the, the concept of the swing vote. OK, it was a factor on the Supreme Court and mm -hmm. it was a factor in the House of Representatives with Joe Lieberman back yes. when Obamacare was being worked on. OK, yes, o Obamacare. All the lefties were like, oh, my God, you know, it's terrible. Obamacare is terrible because it doesn't have a public option. And you know, it's like you fucking weasel. OK, Joe Lieberman sank that. Don't blame Obama. Don't blame right. the Democratic Party. Blame Joe fucking Lieberman. Yep. And, and what are you going to do? Go and do some stupid fucking third party thing that just takes away energy from the only party that is even moving in remotely the right direction, even remotely in the right direction. I understand, again, it, get over the honor, get over your, your, your ideology and get practical. We're in a knife fight in a fucking phone booth. And guess what? I would rather... 
I, it, look, if I have a choice in that fucking phone booth, if if it's either between I'm going to die for my honor or I'm going to take a couple wounds and and be able to fight, come back to fight another day, then I'll fucking take the uh, I'll take the fucking wounds and we'll move on. And tomorrow I'll come back with a bigger knife mm -hmm. and, we'll, and, we'll, and, and we'll and we'll keep fighting. But that's what we have to do. That's what we have to think about. This, this is a long, long term project, Sean. None of this is going to happen overnight. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And we really just have to have to see these people for what they are. They are really have so much in common with Trumpers. They hate institutions. They hate compromise. They hate strategy. And, you know, it's just uh, I, I, you know. I mean, I don't even know if they hate it. I think they just don't understand it. I think it's just like and, and again, it is very Trumpian in the simplicity, simplistic idea of how of how politics works as if as if just because Bernie Sanders were president, then we'd be getting all these things like that's absolutely not how it works. There's dynamics like the the legislative branches have years long dynamics that are always at play, regardless of who is sitting in the White House. And it's just this like, inf infuriatingly simplistic idea of how politics works. Well, and it's also wanting like instant results. Like mm -hmm. Biden still has been president for what? I mean, what has it been like 40 it hasn't days? Even, it hasn't even been a hundred days on the website. I haven't even changed the hero picture yet because it's, <laughs> it, because we are still in the first 100 days to put things yep. in perspective. Wow. And you are already jumping all over the fucking guy. Come on. Yeah. Well, this week in Cray Cray is our next segment. And uh, this is the Q inauguration date of March 4th for Trump to be sworn in came and went. And spoiler alert, Joe Biden is still president. <laughs> That's some heavy, heavy MAGA cope, man. Did you hear there was like four people from California who flew to Washington, D.C. to attend the inauguration on March 4th? <laughs> And they're just they're standing there like a bunch of idiots outside the fucking fence that's around the Capitol, you know, and <laughs> I love now it. they've they've set a new date uh, uh, for March 20th and it should be April 1st for fuck's sake. I, mm. I don't even I just out of things to say again, uh, the House of Representatives canceled its business on the 4th of March because of all this chatter. You know, and it's like, I, I don't even see how any attacks are possible at this point. The Capitol is completely surrounded with a fence and razor wire and checkpoints and no one's getting in or out of there. It just it just pisses me off that we're letting these absolute yahoos disrupt mm -hmm. our government business. What kind of signal does that send? Yeah, it, I mean, I think that it's it, like at this point to be able to disrupt, seriously disrupt what's going on in Washington, you have to be a state level actor, right? Like mm -hmm. no, no average person paramilitary fucking yahoo is doing shit in the fucking capital right now um they have special forces walking around the fucking capital building <laughs> i mean uh yeah go ahead and try attack those guys and see what happens um i uh, i agree though um it's one of these things like don't negotiate with terrorists right mm -hmm. like don't right we we don't don't let the terrorists win you remember how that was flying around back in the uh in the bush era um but really we was like i agree with you on that like uh you know, I, 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 the, the precautions are great and I get it. Um, but still let's not give these people, give these people a platform essentially, you know? Well, yeah. And what they're doing, of course, we have to look at Republicans have not stopped and, and these, these militias and everything, you know, they're, this whole thing is still going on. You know, you, you had CPAC and, you know, Trump speaks at CPAC and he of course rehashed his greatest hits of lies and grievances and election fraud conspiracies. He did say, however, one new and actually very good thing. The Washington Post reported that in his speech, Trump told his audience, so everybody go get your shot. So, I mean, I'm giving him near zero fucking credit for any of this since he's the one who botched the pandemic and killed half a million people. But he easily could have jumped on the anti-vax bandwagon and he didn't. So, you know, I'll give him like a just a maybe just a tiny bit of credit for 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 that, because he probably saved tens of thousands of lives just by that one statement. Mm. So. So that's good news. Um, but bad news is that Mike Pence came out with a, an op-ed, whereas before he was kind of refraining and he sort of st took a step back from the election fraud conspiracies. Now I think the Republican Party is basically unified behind this as a way to cement the drive for voter suppression that they're doing. So um, the, the, the new code phrase is election integrity, and that means just don't let fucking black people vote. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're just exactly so- what it means. They're so Orwellian about it. Election integrity. Hmm, what does that mean? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's hundreds of bills working their way through red state legislatures, including one that you. Th this is just 
like it's so on brand for the Republican Party is that uh, they are now criminalizing the provision of food and water to people standing in line to vote. Yeah, it's it's fucking mind boggling, man. It's mind boggling. I mean, first of all, can we talk about the fact that Trump now is saying is now by implying by taking the shot is implying and telling people to take the shot is implying that it's that the coronavirus is real, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and and similarly, right, uh, in a similar vein, people will then say, but no, but Republicans, conservative, the conservative mind appears to lack the introspection to say, oh, wow, that means he was wrong before, right? right. What, what if he's wrong now about something else, right? And it's the same thing with, it's just a constant moving of the goalposts, right? It's the same thing with the April, with the, I'm um, sorry, with the March 4th, um, inauguration thing. Like now those same people will be like, oh no, well, Trump has a plan. Right. And right. so it's just going to be some other date. And again, you just move the goalposts again. And so that is absolutely infuriating. And what's even more infuriating for me, and particularly, uh, I think it is because I am a person of color, but the voting thing is like that. The fact that this, uh, this electric election integrity nonsense, this Orwellian suppression of the vote is so feels so personal to me because it's mm -hmm. just like uh, it's just a continuation of Jim Crow. It is modern fucking Jim Crow. It is modern post Reconstruction era uh, tactics, but it's just mm -hmm. a new spin on this, and it's just so infuriating. Again, and we're and 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 you know what's going to happen, Sean, is that society culture is going to look back at this one day and say, "Oh wow, that was obviously voter suppression," and then the people, the conservatives of that era, will say, mm -hmm. "Oh yeah, well." That was voter suppression, but what we're doing now isn't, right? Because that's what they're always doing, Sean. Because back in the 60s, they were saying, What are you talking about? It was it, it, it's an equal, it's an equal country, everything's fine. Now we look back and say, obviously it wasn't then, but don't worry, it is now. Yeah. And now then and, and then in 20 years we look back and say, Oh, no, it was it wasn't equal then, but don't worry, it is now. And this is this it's just so infuriating. And we it's a hobby horse we talk about a lot on the show, but wow, it's infuriating. It is. And it's just this is the language of power. This is how power works. It works through deception and outright lies. And, you know, it's it's a cult. Look, this re is reminding me so much of being in our cult, because remember mm. when the dates were set for when the war was supposed to happen? Yes, exactly. And then the, then the date is pushed back and then it's pushed back again. And then we finally get to the end where the war doesn't happen at all. And it's like, oh, we did this by through our prayers. We prevented this from happening. We knew we knew it all along, you know? Yeah, it, it, it is an airtight of airtight circle of bad reasoning, right? You you can never lose. You can never, ever lose because you could always just say, yeah, well, God's plan. And that ultimately is always the fallback mystery. Well, let's just say that uh, religious people have been perfecting this for thousands of years and they're very good at it. Very, very good at it. Um, but accountability might be coming here because ABC News reports that Fulton County, Georgia, seated a grand jury to look into Donald Trump's attempt to alter Georgia's election results. Mm -hmm. And this is this is huge. And I, I'm, I'm not going to read the article now because we're getting a little short on time. But I mean, it what's really awesome is that there's a grand jury looking into this right now and uh, we have the tape. So uh, if they choose to prosecute, Trump will be convicted of that. I hope so, man. I hope so. And like you, you've said this uh, uh, over the course of the last uh, since the election, at least in that way, that is like uh, the news about Trump is going to keep dribbling out over the next several years. And, and and I think especially as we get close to the 2020 to the 20 uh, to the midterms, you're going to see some shit really drop. I think um, I think you're going to see some 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 real shit come out. So I'm really interested to see what happens. I think Democrats are playing the long game and I think that we can we have a shot. We still have a shot. I haven't given up. Me neither. Not yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> so final story for the news is this week in awesome, which is that last Wednesday, SpaceX landed its Starship SN10 prototype on its third try. So That's awesome. It was OK. I missed watching this live because I don't know what I was doing, but I was busy. But the first thing I saw on my timeline was a tweet of a short clip of the SN10 blowing up. So I thought to myself, well, all right, you know, they're going to nail it one of these times not to worry. And I was interested. I wanted to watch the replay because I wanted to see how the engines functioned and if they, you know, improved their performance. And so um, the liftoff, it was spectacular. And the, the hover and drift phase was effortless. I mean, I, I just love how the Starship seems to hang motionless in the air on one Raptor engine. I, I'll just never get tired of seeing that. So cool. <laughs> and of course, we're used to it now seeing this because we've seen three tests, the horizontal glide and the flaps adjusting and, you know, 
But on this particular flight, all three Raptors lit for the flip maneuver, which was really cool because they hadn't done that before. Um, and the starship slowed and it was approaching the ground and two of the Raptors cut off. It was still descending. I noticed that it wasn't coming down as fast as the SN8 or the SN9. And then it touched down and it didn't explode. <laughs> and I was having a hard time believing it because I had just watched it blow up. So I just fucking cheered and, you know, Jillian was going nuts. And <laughs> seeing that Starship just sitting there on the ground in one piece was just absolutely, completely surreal. And um, when the smoke cleared, there was a water cannon cooling off the rocket and it was still venting gas. We noticed that the landing legs hadn't come out and it was kind of leaning to one side, but it just seemed to be a complete success otherwise. And this, this like, you know, 160 foot tall rocket that had just flown 10 kilometers and landed probably the biggest, heaviest object ever to land in controlled vertical flight in human history. And, you know, I don't even think that's an exaggeration. <laughs> it, <laughs> right, right. It, it sat there for like 10 or 15 minutes and the commentators were just freaking out about the success. And then all of a sudden with no warning whatsoever, the whole thing blew up. And I mean, really blew up because the parts of the rocket flew like hundreds of feet into the air. And <laughs> as someone, one of those commentators remarked, you know, it really was the first starship to fly twice. So <laughs> <laughs> I look, I mean, this, you, you and I are both really into technology and into obviously futurism and, and, and uh, Star Trek, obviously. And if the fact that it's called a starship, obviously, is just like, fuck, yes. I mean, yeah, fuck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but just seeing this stuff happen in real time, uh, you know, I, I've been watching The Expanse, uh, starting to watch The Expanse uh, from Amazon. Mm. Um, and uh, and it really is sort of, I think, the most realistic sort of future uh, sort of uh, idea that I've seen in terms of the way they deal with space travel and and and, and fighting in space. But the bottom line is watching the um, watching the Starship, watching SpaceX. It really, it really sort of it kindles the imagination um, in in a way that's really, really exciting. And it really, it's it, it's it's just a little glimpse of what a future might look like. It, of of in terms of cooperation, in terms of uh, all the ideals that we care a lot about here on the Radical Secular. Absolutely. And one of the things that really I have just not been able to get over is that effectively SpaceX is building these things with standard construction equipment. And that's just, you know, what I just wonder, like, what do the Russians think? What do the Chinese think when they're looking over at us? And we just we got cranes and we got forklifts and we got all they just it's just like they're building a building, except it's a rocket. <laughs> right. It's awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, that wraps up our news. I want to move on now to our main topic for today, which is the execution hypothesis. And so we're going to take up chapters five, six, and seven in Richard Rangham's book, The Goodness Paradox. I think we'll need about two more episodes to finish up the entire book, which has 13 chapters. I hope at least some of you have been following along and reading on your own, because I want to say a little bit more about why I chose this particular topic to dedicate several hours of our airtime on this podcast and why understanding our evolution is central to what it means to be radically secular. A, a main consequence of a religious or spiritual orientation is a rose-colored view of humanity. So choose darkness, right? Mm -hmm. we, you know, we simply can't overstate the damage caused by the widely shared myths about divine and human perfection. You know, Plato's cave even engages in all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. the world of forms, all this perfection. It's not real life. And this is why we're sticklers here for evolutionary psychology. Uh, if you walk around believing that your true nature is some sort of mythical godlike perfection, and even worse, that you and the people around you are spirits or souls or beings of light or angels trapped in human form, you're going to be an easy mark for con artists, gaslighters, and abusers. If you see corruption, violence, and terrible behavior as the result of devils or demon possession, lack of godliness, you're not going to support social accountability. You're going to get involved in trying to expand useless prayer, uh, fight useless culture wars while leaving the human causes of depravity unchallenged. I mean, this is just, this is textbook what we're going through right now. Um, yeah. I just can't overstate how important this is. Uh, religious and spiritual non-solutions are a direct block to actual human problem solving. They, they can't coexist. This is, just goes from climate to economics to anything you can think of. One, the, 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 the spiritual solution always crowds out the, the physical, real human solution. And if a society turns to religion and superstition for answers, mass confusion and death are never far behind. There's a reason why we called it the dark ages. 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm reminded as we talk about this, about growing up and being told that, you know, there, that I have my God self that's in my threefold flame. This is the sort of the cult, by the way, from everyone out there, the cult language that we grew up with. Um, and that there is our, my, my holy Christ self and this idea that there is, you know, first of all, it implies that there's something fl- inherently flawed or bad about me. Right. Mm-hmm. My real actual physical self and the, the animal that is Christoph Defoe named Christoph Defoe for whatever reason. Um, mm-hmm. But also it really it but it but it and then it, it it abstracts this idea that there's something inherently like like beautiful and, and loving inside of me that uh, that 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 is that is free from that earthly evil. And it's like you said, extremely, extremely destructive for practical reasons. And I think it's important that we do draw that line for people that it's not an abstract thing that we're talking about here. We're talking about the, 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 the these delusions have real, real world consequences uh, for human flourishing. Well, and, and this is like when we talk about people think this is abstract. Okay. When we talk about chimps and bonobos, we're talking about ourselves. Mm-hmm. I, I can't stress exactly. enough how important it is to your psychological and social health to accept yourself as a mammal, as a primate, as yes. homo sapiens, you know, complete with all of your evolutionary baggage. Primates have been evolving for tens of millions of years with hominids showing up about 4 million years ago. Homo habilis that, you know, Joe Acapinti talked about mm-hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago, the tool user evolved around 3 million years ago. And the rise of homo sapiens took place only around 300,000 years ago. So recorded civilization after the agricultural revolution is only 10 to 12,000 years old. And it's so recent that most of our evolved mental responses are still geared toward our survival in pre-civilization conditions. So they're going to come up at all times. So for the vast, vast majority of human evolution took place without our ancestors having had any self-concept as anything other than being first among animals. That's what primate means. And they came from nature, they were and are a part of nature. And I want to read a post I wrote on Facebook about this this past week. It says, don't use connection to nature as an excuse for your fantasy projection of spirituality. Any connection we have with the natural world is by definition physical. We are not just connected to the natural world, we are the natural world. It is in us and all around us. It is not possible for us to be disconnected from nature because we are nature. The molecules that form our body, the water we drink on a daily basis, the food we eat, came from countless dead stars. A star is the only natural method in the universe that can create the heavier atoms that are the basis of chemistry, organic and otherwise. Statistically, every breath you take probably contains at least one molecule that was exhaled by everyone who's ever lived, and probably a lot of the animals who've ever lived as well. Something like 10% of the carbon in your body comes from industrial combustion and has therefore been emitted by a tailpipe or smokestack at some point. So aside from being nature, we are now also the industrial world, literally in our bodies. Industrial carbon is not harmful to us because it went through a car's engine or came from a furnace or factory. Those carbon atoms are like any other and they work their way from the atmosphere into plants that we eat and become part of our bodies. Ultimately, they came from still other plants and animals from millions of years ago. My point is here that humans are not separate. We are part of Earth's environment just as our ancestors were. We share the same basic chemical and genetic components they did. The more you truly understand evolution and the true circle of life, the less you need to engage in spiritual or religious fantasy projection. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, um, you know, uh, we're dealing with the same hardware that uh, that that we were that our ancestors were dealing with in the ancestral environment. Right. We are that. And so we are a adapting that mind that brain to modern civilization and that's a really important thing to understand but what i want to hit on here also is and this i think you're getting at this uh, at least partially in in this post and that is we are there's real freedom in mm-hmm. recognizing that recognizing that we are identical to the environment in which we live we are not separate from that and it's interesting there is a uh, and in spirituality there is a spirituality in that right mm-hmm. there is there is a there's a meaningfulness in that and when i talk about meditation for example um that is what i am trying to connect with right it, it, it is is the sameness of mm-hmm. all of us and everything and um and there is nothing supernatural about that that's what's important right there's nothing dualist or supernatural about that it is purely natural 
Well, and this is an interesting um, conversation that I hope that we all have, because I know that uh, Joe Acapinti has some thoughts about this. And really it is, do you relate to the universe through consciousness, right? Or do you relate to it as being connected to everything through matter? And I, I'm not sure that the two are really separate, but I think that there's some interesting uh, dialogue that we can have about the difference in approaches to getting at what I think is really the same thing. I think it's kind of like the blind man and the elephant, right? We're all looking at the Agreed. same thing. We're just talking about it in different language. And I absolutely agree with you on that. I think we really are. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 you're good. Um, I, I, it was just, I was just saying that I think that though that language matters because just like it matters with social justice, how we talk about things, the way that we frame things with language is how we frame them politically and how we frame mm -hmm. them ethically. And so uh, it really is, I do think, important for us to, to, to resolve kind of those differences in framing. Agreed. I think that's absolutely right. And um, I and I agree with you that we are basically talking, and this is why I think Joe uh, is is such a great addition because we're we're we we're talking about the sim like similar values, similar ideas, similar concepts from different perspectives, and I do think that hashing out the language, frankly, the most effective language to and a most effective approach to expressing these ideas, I think, is really really important for political reasons, if for no other reason. Yeah. Yeah, def I'm looking forward to that episode. But mm -hmm. um, for today, let's dive back into our book and talk about chimpanzees and bonobos. Let's do it. <laughs> As you may recall, last time we ended the episode by discussing how Dmitry Belayev, the Soviet geneticist, uh, he bred silver haired foxes that were so peaceful that they could be kept as pets. Um, chapter, filed, chapter five that we're starting on today is called Wild Domesticates. And Richard Rangham considers the question of whether there have ever been examples of other species which have experienced selection against reactive aggression other than humans. And mm -hmm. he concludes that there are uh, domestication without a domesticator. And uh, so the ancestor of bonobos was very similar to a chimpanzee. And we know that bonobos are incredibly more peaceful than chimps. So something happened to chimps to create the more domestic bonobos. Rangham writes, the easiest way to distinguish between the two is to note the bonobo's smaller head topped by hair with a central parting of hair. Bonobos are also unique for their pink lips, even though the rest of their face is uniformly dark. The two species live separated by the Congo River that winds around Africa's equator in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Chimpanzees on the right bank to the north of the river, the bonobos on the left bank. Bonobos and chimpanzees share much of their social behavior. Both live in communities of a few dozen individuals, including more females than males. Community members inhabit a common territory, which they defend against encroachers from neighboring communities. Within the territory, they form changing subgroups, also known as parties, of a few individuals up to 20 or 30 or more. They travel alone at times. Sons never leave their native community, but daughters mostly do. Around the time when a daughter reaches puberty, she tends to leave her mother and move to a different community where she will spend the rest of her life. So this is super interesting because, you know, there's this geographic separation between the range habitat of bonobos and chimps. Rangam notes that due to the Congo River, the chimps had to compete with mountain gorillas for resources on the north side of the river, while bonobos had more plentiful food on the south side. We don't know exactly what happened there over hundreds of thousands of generations, but we do know that it led to bonobos being more domesticated. And if you observe the incredible differences in violence between the two species, it, it's really difficult not to make comparisons between the behavior of chimps and bonobos and the two basic factions of humans which are authoritarian honor cultures and, you know, politicians behave more like chimps while egalitarian cultures and politicians behave more like bonobos. Um, chimps are extremely aggressive when they're introduced to new individuals while bonobos accept newcomers gracefully. Chimp males fight over status. Male chimps beat up on females to intimidate them into sex. Uh, the more aggressive a male chimp, the more offspring he's likely to have. Adult chimps kill infants. Adult male chimps sometimes gang up on another male and beat him to death. Male chimps unite for warfare against other communities. Sometimes they catch and kill a helpless victim of another community for the purpose of intimidation. Does this all sound familiar? I was like, are you, did you just describe the modern Republican Party? Because <laughs> I, like that is that is basically the profile of the modern conservative. Um, and and look, I mean, the, it, this is I think important to 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 hit on, and that is that we 
as human beings have both of these strains in us, right? Um, mm-hmm. We like as, as the conservative mind and the progressive mind are leaned more toward one or the other of those uh, of those sort of uh, ideas. I mean, the way I can I think about this now is sort of better angels, right? The better angels versus our inner demons, right? Mm-hmm. Like that is sort of, and the bonobo really personifies those those better angels in a lot of ways, right? And I, I, I try and stay away from cold, hard dichotomies for all the reasons why we always talk about here, because it's it's overly, it, it's, it's more complex than that. We are all, as human beings, capable of both. But it is really astonishing to hear how much the bonobo, I'm sorry, the chimpanzee description tracks what we think of as like the modern sort of chest beating, woman beating conservative. Mm-hmm. It's scary. I mean, you think about. I, I would not want to go anywhere near, uh, you know, a, a, a community of, of chimps. Unprotected. No, absolutely <laughs> not. They are dangerous, dangerous animals. Yeah, and, and so, so are we, are, by the way. So are humans. Yeah, I mean, it's like now you're about you're about to say the same thing. Like, so are we. Incredibly dangerous. <laughs> Well, it's exactly why you don't want to end up in a small town in the south somewhere. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, uh, and then we have guns. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Add that in. Right. Add that in. And really, really high, high intelligence. Right. Like, wow. What a toxic brew. It really is. Well, bonobos behave completely differently. Males don't beat up females or practice infanticide. Male bonobos don't compete over status, which is determined by their mother's rank. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, When bonobos interact with each other with another community, there is little violence. Instead, they tend to groom each other and have sex. Sounds good to me. Make love, not war, right? (laughs) Uh, Adult bonobos freely play with the children of other communities, and there's no fear of the children being harmed. Uh, When two male chimpanzees are introduced into a room with a single reward, such as a banana, the dominant chimp immediately seizes the food for himself while the other goes off and sulks. (laughs) (laughs) Bonobos will share the food. And even beyond sharing it, if they see another bonobo outside a room where they're eating, they will open the door. And they will often have sex with the newcomer before even sharing the food with them. They just love having sex, like for anything. Like it's basically like a say. I loved reading this in the book. They basically it is just a way of just of of cooling off tension. Yeah, they, it's it, great. It's like it's like they they have sex like they say hello. You know exactly kind of exactly. So anatomically, bonobos have a, have smaller skulls than chimps, a sign of domestication. A significant explanation for their improved behavior is that they have twice as many serotonin receptors in their amygdalas as chimps do. Uh, Rangham writes that these differences evolved over as many as 35,000 generations. Earlier hominids had skull shapes and sizes more similar to chimpanzees, so it really seems that something important happened on the bonobo side of the evolutionary tree that had never happened before, which was the evolution of cooperation through domestication. But that's not all that happened. Domesticated animals generally demonstrate a greater variety of sexual activity, and bonobos are no exception. Homosexual genital rubbing is common, especially among females. Rangham writes, So, what is it about bonobos that makes aggression less profitable for them than it is for chimpanzees? Among chimpanzees, males practice the most frequent and dangerous forms of violence, and yet male bonobos are relatively unimposing. So the question is really about males. Ultimately, bonobo psychology has evolved to the point where males show less interest in dominating others, whether female or male, than chimpanzees do. The deeper question is why, over evolutionary time, males with gentler, less aggressive proclivities tended to have higher reproductive success. Female power is clearly an important part of the answer. A male bonobo who confronts an adult female might well win if she is the only female in earshot. But female bonobos are rarely far from other females. The challenging male must expect that if he makes a female scream, within seconds he may be confronted by a coalition of females ready to attack him, and so effective in doing so that his best response will be to run away. Female support for one another explains why males give up easily when competing with females over food, or why males rarely try to bully females, or why males do not on average outrank females. Coalitionary attacks need not be common. The primatologist Martin Serbeck and Gottfried Homan found that although females in the wild can use coalitions well, they do so rarely, mostly when males threaten their young. Despite their size disadvantage, females very effectively suppress bullying by males. Males seem to have learned where the ultimate power lies that numbers beat physical strength. 
And so this is like, this passage is really an amazing clue to what we're going to talk about later in terms of the execution hypothesis, because among bonobos, it was clearly the females who implemented the domestication process, but they didn't do it through killing. They did it through female cooperation and through cooperation, female dominance. This is, I believe, the model that we're following in modern human civilization and provides an important lesson. The more females are empowered, the less likely it is that we'll have to use personal or state violence to kill troublemakers who are overwhelmingly male. This is just win, win, win. Doesn't that sound great to you, Christoph? Sounds fucking awesome, man. It really, really does. And look, I, I would just love for, I, I wish that there were, uh, we had a, a human women would sort of support each other in the same way. <laughs> Um, and uh, support justice in the same way that these bonobo, bonobo women are, you know? <laughs> if we could get rid of the, you know, the anti, anti uh, suffragette women, right? The, exactly. the women voting against the ERA, the women mm -hmm. who are against the Violence Against Women Act. How, how, how is that even possible, right? Mm -hmm. so, patriarchy, patriarchy, <laughs> man, fucking patriarchy. And, and this is this is what's different about humans is that we've uh, is that we've allowed that patriarchy has somehow figured out how to co-opt women. Yep, and, exactly. So, but not with bonobos. Further unders <laughs> <laughs> underscoring this finding, Rangam writes that in captivity, chimp females will develop deep bonds with other female chimps so long as the males are removed. Mm hmm. So, male interesting chimps, little fact a factoid there. That is that the males figure out how to set the female chimps against each other, which is exactly what happened here. This is exactly what's happening in our country right now. So um, there's another benefit to the feel, female empowerment of bonobos, and that is the ability to take less aggressive mates. Since there was little competition for food in their habitat, natural selection continued to reinforce the trend of breeding with more submissive males. And that's how bonobos self-domesticated. There's a lot more to it than that. And that's why I highly recommend for all of you out there to read this book. Yeah, it's really an outstanding book. Um, and I actually listened to the audiobook, and the the, the audiobook is out fucking standing. The uh, the reader, the the uh, the reader is I don't know what's a better term for that. Anyway, the reader is really outstanding, and I love the British readers, and it's like this sort of dry, unbelievably good delivery. Um, but I but what I wanted to say in terms of the uh, the bonobos and in terms of the female bonobos is it's 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 really i think it's important that we recognize that um uh maleness is inherently in some sense at least in the primate context volatile selfish and angry um and it and in that's what we're talking about when we talk about toxic masculinity, right? We're not mm -hmm. talking about the existence of men or that men are inherently bad. We're saying that let's not celebrate those violent, angry, uh, you know, domineering tendencies. Let's allow women to temper, temper the male aggressive, overly aggressiveness, right? Um, and that is how we solve the problems. As you're saying, this is how I think we can move our, our society and our culture forward um, from a world. But look at look at the last look at the 20th century. The 20th century was been and the, and the 19th century, the 18th. They've been run by men. And look, it is a story of war and domination. It, it, you know, so like, let's try something different. Well, this is the thing is that in nature, what we're finding is that nature being red in tooth and claw is 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 essentially male dominance right mm -hmm, exactly. and it is the most it is the most common form of evolution is dominance but mm -hmm. when we see with species like bonobos and and certain human cultures as well there has been successful more cooperative nurturing cultures and we have to choose right because now we're in exactly charge. right we're in charge of, of our own evolution and we have to choose which way we're going to go either one can work it's no yeah, question exactly. about it. Yeah, right, right, right. Exactly right. Absolute dominance does work. You can do theocracy, you know, mm -hmm. right? You can do uh you can do totalitarianism. You absolutely can. Um, it's just a question of who want how many people you want to be happy, you know. Yeah, and evolution doesn't care about your happiness, as we know. It sure doesn't. It sure doesn't. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to chapter six, which is called Belayev's Rule in Human Evolution. If you recall in chapter four, the behavioral changes in Belayev's silver foxes were accompanied by what Rangam calls domestication syndrome. This means certain physical changes, such as shrinking skulls, uh, white 
forehead patches, and others. It turns out that the syndrome works in the opposite direction. When scientists observe the physical markers of domestication syndrome, they can infer that that species has undergone some form of selection for reduced aggression. And this is true of humans as well. I'm not going to go into detail, but the fact that Homo sapiens have smaller skulls, less prominent jaws, thinner femurs, more feminine features than earlier hominids, and that sexual dimorphism has decreased are all evidence of human domestication. Compared to Homo habilis, for example, Homo sapiens is far more domestic and peaceful. The domestication began at least 315,000 years ago and continues right up to the present day. Notably, Homo sapiens neanderthalis did not undergo this domestication and retained its coarse features and large skull right up until its extinction about 40,000 years ago. So what was it that led to the domestication of modern humans but left Neanderthals unchanged? Right, right. Uh, and uh, but before you move on, I just want to point out that the, one of the greatest features of the of the uh, domestication syndrome is the cute little uh, socks that go on the bottom of cat feet uh, <laughs> and, and floppy ears on dogs. Uh, these are all such features of the domesticated the domestication syndrome that don't have any real practical outcome, but they just for some reason happen. Um, and it's adorable. Yeah, well. Cute animals make people happy. That's a, they sure do. Watching videos of cute animals is, is a way to reduce stress. It really is. So It really is. <laughs> do more of that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, to answer the question we just posed, <clears throat> we'll move on to chapter seven, which is the tyrant problem. Uh, in this chapter, mm -hmm. Rangam recounts Darwin's interesting proposal of the execution hypothesis. He writes, the kind of moral behavior that Darwin was most concerned about was selfless helping. The conventional wisdom during Darwin's time regarded the moral sensibilities responsible for such self-sacrificial cooperation as a blessing provided by a benef beneficent God, you know. Um, but the idea that morality was God-given posed a challenge to Darwin's evolutionary theory because Darwin proposed that all of life's features had evolved without the interference of a deity. If evolutionary theory was to be as complete as Darwin hoped, he had to explain morality without invoking the influence of religious beings. So Darwin focused on aggression, the opposite of moral virtue. He wanted to know why humans are in many ways so unaggressive. He asked himself what happens to hyperaggressive men. He appeared to take for granted the idea that men tend to be the more violent than women, a sex difference that has been richly confirmed. <laughs> richly. I love that. When he, That's richly. Under <laughs> it's such a great understatement. And just picture that being delivered by a dry British voice. You know, yeah. it's perfect. It's perfect. Richly confirmed. <laughs> exactly. It's great. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Darwin had an answer to his question about the fate of exceptionally aggressive men. In regard to moral qualities, he wrote, some elimination of the worst dispositions is always progress even in the most civilized nations. Malefactors are executed or imprisoned for long periods so that they cannot freely transmit their bad qualities. Violent and quarrelsome men often come to a bloody end. <laughs> That's the, I mean, it's obviously live by the sword, die by the sword, right? That didn't yeah. come from nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and, and this right here, by the way, is the point of departure as to why religious people simply can't ever accept Darwin. It's twofold, okay? First, Darwin came directly to grips with the consequentialist notion that sometimes it's necessary to kill for the greater good. And second, Darwin proposed a complete theory of human morality that removed the requirement of a divinely imposed system of rewards and punishments. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so important. We talked about this last episode, why these and you talked about it earlier uh, in this episode, which is these two these two things are cannot coexist. They mute they're mutually exclusive. If you are a person who is a Darwinist, which if you are reasonable, you should be, mm -hmm. then uh, you, you then it literally by definition cancels out the entire religious moral um, 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 uh, moral basis for morality. And so you can't you can't do both. And like the like the absurd absurdity of sort of like Christian intellectuals trying to trying to trying to hold these two contrary contrary ideas in their head at the same time is it's it's comical. It's comical to watch people turn themselves into knots trying to reconcile these two things, but they're they're irreconcilable. Completely. It's just a moral inversion. Like mm -hmm. if you believe one, you can't believe the other. And this is exactly. why we it's been it's been, you know, well over 150 years since Darwin came up with this idea. And we're still not we haven't accepted it. It's just because it just turns, it turns the world's power structures on it on on their heads, 
really. Power, and that's the key. You just nailed it right there. It turns the power structures on its head, and that is precisely why it doesn't change. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we understood with the bonobo discussion earlier, it's really simply a natural accident of a habitat south of the Congo River with abundant food that led to the evolution of this increased cooperation and the development of a much improved culture of morality among primates. And something similar took place with the ancestors of Homo sapiens. They began to cooperate to crush tyrants. Cooperation also became a factor in war. Groups with improved cooperation became more formidable to their enemies. This reaches a limit, as Darwin observed, people willing to sacrifice their lives in war wouldn't live to pass on their genes. So Darwin looked for other explanations for domesticated Homo sapiens' high tendency for cooperation. Uh, evolutionary biologist Richard Alexander proposed that reputation is the key. And in order for reputation to play a role, humans needed to develop language and especially gossip. Okay. Mm -hmm. When a person's reputation becomes widely known, good behavior is rewarded and bad behavior is punished. And th there you go. Your first instance of cancel culture right there. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, you know, chimpanzees might observe the bad behavior of another chimp, but they wouldn't be able to tell anyone about it. And the lack of language, therefore, impedes their domestication. But humans have no such problem. Our ancestors have steadily evolved to be kinder and less violent. Language begat reputation and reputation begat morality, Rangam writes. And this runs directly counter to widespread religious admonitions across many cultures against gossip and against judging. Turn the other cheek and other biblical calls for forgiveness directly interfere with the process of reputational accountability. So we can see that the broad divide between Darwinian morality and Christian morality is as problematic as evolution itself. It's one thing to say that God didn't create humans. That's insult enough to believers. But the final blow is to assert that human morality predates religion and involves ignoring religious teachings about good and evil and especially forgiveness. These are just incredible fighting words to those who want to believe in a divinely ordered universe. Uh, yeah, man, absolutely. I think, and this is absolutely fascinating. First of all, that there is like, another sort of dichotomy here is this idea that there is some sort of divine plan Mm -hmm. on one end and the idea the evolutionary idea that it's it's almost accidental that we're here right like there happened to be a river between the bonobos and the fucking chin you know what i'm saying like like mm -hmm. that like these things are happy accidents that that then drove a certain kind of evolution that ended up with us here it was not inevitable right um mm -hmm. it was not inevitable and that is that i think really picks at the at the at the believers idea of the uh, uh, sort of epistemology and uh and and sort of view of the world because it says no you're not here because of some plan your life is frankly irrelevant except mm -hmm. for to you and the people who care about you but there is evolution their life is just trying to perpetuate itself and everything that happens as a result of that is a happy accident including you and i think there's something deeply disturbing about that but it need mm -hmm. not be deeply disturbing in fact it can be very very freeing and i find it deeply deeply freeing to be able to to for example rick recognize that the fact that i tend to gossip or or a human being tend to gossip doesn't make it's not a moral issue about me as a bad person or a good person and the the cosmic ledger is is not being is not being it's not being ticked one way or the other because i talk about somebody i'm just doing what a human animal does it does and look it can be her heart it can be harmful and I shouldn't be harmful and I shouldn't hurt people, but let's not pretend that there's something inherently wrong with me. And that's why I gossip. Well, look, it's just, you're just participating in a system. Okay. This is a communication system by which civilization is held together. And mm -hmm. of course people gossip and they tell lies. All right. And that is a way of gaming the system. And mm -hmm. that's just the way that's how systems are, right? When you have intelligent agents who are trying to come out on top, they're going to try to game the system. That doesn't mean the system is bad. Exactly. Um, and, and I want to go back to one other thing when you because you, you mentioned this happy coincidence of of, you know, the bonobos e evolving in an area of plentiful food. Mm -hmm. Well, the opposite is also true that the cradle of civilization was kind of in a in a desert area. Right. Mm. And our religions that were developed, the main Abrahamic religions were developed because in, in a place of, of of scarcity and suffering. And wow, I did not think about that. That is mind boggling. But right. <laughs> but happy accidents. I mean, wow, that could have gone just a different direction, but it just didn't. And here we are. You 
No, well, I mean, like if you look at forest religions, right, where there's where there's plentiful food and water and and all that, you know, they tend to be much more uh, matriarchal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, pagan paganism and and you know, and witchcraft and all these you know earth religions are very very matriarchal. So sure. It, it all like if we had had if our if our cradle of civilization had been in a in a lush area with plentiful food, we might not be dealing with angry God Yahweh right now. Exactly. Bo bo boggles the mind, boggles the mind. Well, we still have un unanswered questions about tyrants, right? Because if someone is strong enough and violent enough, why couldn't they just ignore other people's gossip about their reputations? I mean, who cares what anyone thinks if you can just overpower them? So. How could a female express her selection preference for a less dominant male if the dominant male could just rape her and bully everyone else? This is how chimpanzees handle things. But when it came to mid-Pleistocene humans, who was to stop the tyrant? Rangam writes, shunning would be insufficient to affect an individual who is able to intimidate or defeat all others in a fight. Subordinates' resentment could be translated to effective resistance only by coalitionary force. Cooperation among the weaker individuals is needed. One use of social power is to teach the aggressor to accept defeat. Mm. Among hunter-gatherers, as we will see, aggressors are stopped not by repeated coalitionary chases and not by females acting on their own. When teasing and pleading and ostracizing and moving camp all fail to change a man's violent behavior, the last resort of the coalition is execution, as Darwin foresaw. The execution hypothesis claims that during the Pleistocene, a new kind of ability crystallized. For the first time, coalitions of males became effective at deliberately killing any member of their social group who was prepared to use violence on his own behalf and simply did not care what others thought about him. In the end, execution was the only way to stop such a male from being a tyrant. And wow, man, uh, this is to me a really, really nice use of Occam's razor, given what we know about the evolution of hominids. Mm -hmm. Killing, bullying, troublemakers was the only thing that would have worked. And apparently Homo sapiens did it while the Neanderthals did not. And this all sets us up really nicely for a discussion of capital punishment that we'll have in a later episode, because Richard Wrangham is passionately against the use of capital punishment in modern society. And we have our own ideas about that too. So mm -hmm. that brings us to the end of our show for today. Any final thoughts, Christoph? Well, um, I will say, you know, the, uh, first of all, great, uh, great show, great uh, presentation, Sean, as always. But I will say this in, in closing, and that is the Trump and Z moniker. Mm. Doesn't that feel so right after having talked about this book? Right. It feels like, well, yeah, they really it's like because you think just generally it was just making fun. Of, and really, that's what people were doing when they made when they said that they were just saying, oh, ha ha ha. They're like animals or they're like monkeys or whatever. But like but in a very fundamental way, it couldn't be a more effective effective uh uh insult uh, because it really does connect with that core nature of the chimpanzee so anyway mm -hmm. um i thought that's a really funny little little thing that i just thought about just now <laughs> uh, it's it's deeply true on a level that is it's just not obvious unless you've actually gone and done the work and the research you won't know how true that really is mm -hmm. so all right, well, if you like our show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, check out theradicalsecular.com and tell your friends to listen. New episodes post Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. And if you're into reading, check out the blog at theradicalsecular.com. I'm Sean Prophet. Thank you for being here. And remember, wherever you are, you can be radically secular. <laughs>